All right, good afternoon, everybody. Hope, uh, hope everyone's enjoying the conference. Uh, awesome turnout, right? Just amazing to see all the different talks, you know, a lot of uh, very technical talks, um, you know, some really good, uh, you know, career-minded discussions going on. The, the diversity here is fantastic. And um, I think the biggest thing is that it's great to be here in person. Um, you know, I, we still all get on Zoom calls all the time. I'm sure it's just, it's part of our life. It's part of our world. Um, but it's nice to be in person, actually shake hands with somebody, say hello, you know, have a face-to-face -face conversation. But going back to the Zoom calls, because we're still on them all the time, I like to, to start with uh, things overheard on a Zoom call, um, just to get us rolling. And we're going to go with product teams and engineering teams and uh, leadership teams. Uh, the first one is we need to empower developers with security. It's always a good one to hear. Um, another one we hear is, it's not clear about how we need to enable security within our products and what the requirements are for us to be successful. And then probably my favorite one is, leadership team, we need to shift left, right? So I'm sure we, um, it, and again, the, the shift left movement is, uh, it's, it's a great thing. Um, you know, the fact that we're, um, you know, we're, uh, we're, we're really seeing developers being empowered with security, um, you know, being enabled, you know, trained in, in, in our software development processes, you know, getting stronger and stronger from a security pr perspective. It's fantastic, but what are the ways to really do this effectively? Um, and that's what this talk is, is partially about, is looking at some of the different open source security tools that are out there um, and evaluating those open source security tools and understanding what, what are some of the uh, you know, leading practices and, and tools out there that are going to help us to reduce vulnerabilities within our software applications and our software development processes to help us get stronger and, and help us you know, help our um, applications be more resilient to attack um, and just overall um, you know, reduce threats and vulnerabilities. So um, that's what this talk is about, is the top five open source security tools that we think every developer should know. All right, so just to kind of get rolling here, uh, you know, quick introduction. So I'm, my name's Chris Kennecke. My last name is very difficult to spell. You can just call me Chris. Uh, but I'm the VP of Security Engineering in CISO at JIT. We are a startup uh, based out of Tel Aviv, Israel, like many other cybersecurity companies. Uh, we're about 40 people strong, focused on application security. Um, and this talk is really, um, it, you know, it's, it's, it, it stems from a lot of the work that we did on analyzing open source tools and sharing some of the findings uh, and some of the recommendations uh, from the talk. Um, prior to joining JIT, I joined about nine months ago, um, and I was the first U.S. employee. My, uh, my other um, you know, co-workers and team members are all based in Tel Aviv. Um, I was with KPMG for 15 years, so I did you know, cybersecurity consulting, I led our cloud security compliance practice at KPMG, which basically meant that we took, you know, different, um, you know, service providers, tech companies, could be startups, could be big companies. We took them through these arduous, um, you know, cloud security compliance processes. Many of you are familiar with, I'm sure. Some are more baseline, like SOC 2 and ISO. Some are super challenging, like FedRAMP. Uh, it was an awesome experience. I love the consulting side of the house. Um, but I saw that too many times we'd come in as consultants and we'd bring in processes that were, you know, they're too heavy handed, too laborious. Developers didn't own them. They didn't stick. They would, they would, you know, really stifle developer velocity uh, and ultimately would make it challenging, um, you know, for, for products to grow and improve over time. And the developers didn't want to utilize some of these processes. So I got the opportunity, one of my clients started JIT. Um, uh, which stands for Just In Time, the company that I work for, and uh, really gave you know uh, gave me the opportunity to say, hey, let's let's you know the shift left movement again, but let's let's give developers you know real tools and functions they can utilize uh, to improve application security. So that's a bit about me. Um, 
I'm a, you know, I, I love to travel. Um, you know, I, I love, um, I love live music as well. Um, definitely love the outdoors. So it's great to be here in Salt Lake City. You know, obviously amazing winter with the, uh, the ski conditions. If anybody got out there, I'm sure many of you did. The locals, incredible. And the summertime's amazing here too, by the way, the hiking and the biking, everything else. So nice to be here. I live in Texas. So like many other Texans and Californians, we like to come and, and, sh and enjoy your, your land. So thank you for that. Um, all right. So, um, one other thing too I wanted to share is that since I am, so I'm the first US employee for JIT, if anybody wants to snap a quick you know, photo here or there, I would appreciate it and send it to me because I like to send stuff back to the team in Tel Aviv. They, you know, they wish they could be here, quite frankly. Many of the developers on my team, they love these conferences. So uh, I, I'm very proud to be an ambassador for a company. Um, all right, so kind of getting in the talk here, um, again, the five open source security tools that, you know, every developer should know. What are we going to cover? First off, you know, categories for the tools, right? We're going to go through a structured process of looking at you know, how we kind of uh, group the different tools and where they fit into the software development process. Um, then we're going to do an evaluation um, of those open source security tools, kind of how we, how we do the evaluation. Then I'll share some specific recommendations. And you know, just to be clear is that you know, these are our recommendations. Um, again, we're a startup. Um, you know, we, we're, we're you know, AWS, serverless, GitHub. Uh, it's actually quite nice to be a company that started the past couple of years because we were very progressive from a CI/CD perspective. I realize not everybody has that luxury uh, in the room. Maybe some more on-prem and legacy tech that's part of your, you know, part of your environment, and your tech stack. But still, I think the recommendations will be super helpful for you guys. Um, and then, you know, how to leverage the tools um, overall, and then how you can learn more about the tools, and of course, follow up from there. Uh, all right, so here's the here's the categories for the tools that we're going to go through. Uh, of course, we got our code scanners, you know, our static code analysis scanning, you know, looking at you know secrets detection. That's a very important piece. Uh, you know, dependency checking with all the focus on software supply chain and making sure our software libraries are up to date. You know, is a is a very uh, you know key attack vector, uh, especially in the news in the past couple of years. Um, infrastructure is code scanners. So we'll look at those as well. Uh, container scanning for your software packages, um, and then runtime scanning as well. So those are the five categories that we're going to cover. Um, all right. So first off, you know, how do how do you evaluate an open source tool, security tool, and how did what was the process that we followed, uh, you know, to be able to kind of pick the tools, like pick and choose, because there's a lot out there. Um, one thing I will say before getting into this too is like why open source? You may wonder, right? Open source. A couple reasons why we really value it as a startup. We love the fact that it's free. Obviously, having a free tool out there is fantastic. Um, you know, if, if, it, if it meets the need. Um, we also like the fact that we feel like a lot of these open source tools and the way that you've got a community supporting these tools, if it's, you know, obviously if it's maintained appropriately, we really like that fact, right? Getting away from the whole security by obscurity and having a community kind of build in some of these tools and the kind of the different inputs, that's a really valuable thing. Um, so that's, that's why we like open source. Not that we don't like commercial tools as well. There's great commercial tools out there too. Uh, but this talk will, be, will focus on open source. Um, now the evaluation criteria, um, you know, if you look at the result quality, obviously it's so important out there that, you know, the findings from the tool, right? Are they accurate, right? Can you trust them, right? That's the most important thing for any tool, uh, but certainly for an, for an open source security tool. Uh, the next one is developer experience. Um, you know, again, if we want developers to really own these, to own security and utilize tools and have automated ways to be able to detect vulnerabilities and fix issues quickly and just in time within your, you know, within your code as you're developing, uh, we want that developer experience to be as, you know, as easy as possible, quite frankly. Uh, maturity. I talked about, you know, uh, we like open source because we've got these different inputs, right? We might have, there might be a, you know, a team lead or a development lead, but there's different inputs. But you know, how often is that tool being updated? You know, is the, is it you know is the tool been stranded? Is it um, you know is there, is there a potential that um, the tool isn't you know is no longer being up updated to you know, with the latest threats and, and and issues? That's an important piece. And then of course, you know the customizability. Um, and I get you know for every environment's a little bit different, so you want to make sure that tool is going to meet your needs and your environment. So this is kind of the high level criteria that we utilize just to kind of start our process, right, for our evaluation of the tools. Um, and just to you know, cover the, the topics, right, so for you know, result quality, look at accuracy, 
you know, uh, the, de the developer perception of that result correctness, right? So we want to make sure, you know, looking at how many false positives and false negatives are out there, right? Running the actual tools on your code, right? And, um, and you know, getting those results, right? That gives you comfort that you're getting results that you can trust as a developer. Um, so that's a really important piece. And then comparing those results, you know, with other tools as well. For the developer experience, right, um, you look at, hey, can we run this everywhere, right? Locally on our terminal and an IDE within the CI, it's got to, you know, it's got to be, it's got to be more quickly, right? The tool's got to, uh, you, know, qu you know, quick scans, quick results. Um, you know, results can be, are easily readable, uh, and we can, you know, run the tool ourselves to kind of feel, you know, get that experience as a developer. Um, from a, a maturity perspective, uh, you know, the level of support activity and stability of the tool. Again, is it popular? You know, I think about like the restaurant reviews here, right? Like, before you go out, like there's a million good restaurants in Salt Lake City, by the way, and like there's, they're growing all the time. I've learned that coming here for work quite a bit. Um, what do the Google reviews look like, right? For, or if you still use Yelp, for the Yelp reviews for, uh, for restaurants, um, you know, the stars, the forks, the watchers. It's not everything, but it's an important thing to look at, right? What's the community think about this tool? Um, is the tool owned and actively contributed to? I talked about, like, is the tool stranded, you know, is it, uh, or has it been updated on a regular basis? You want to check to see that. And then, of course, the licensing, right? Because sometimes you can say, hey, the tool is open source, but you just get this little piece of it, right? You, do, you know, you have to pay for all the additional, uh, you know, features and functionality. Um, so that's an important piece, too, from a, a licensing perspective. Um, and then the customizability. Um, you know, the extent to which the, the, the tool can be tailored for you, again, based off your, your environment, um, right? So if it's, if it's too generalizable, the, you know, does it, the potential for less uh, utility for your environment, um, you know, and can the tool be configured specifically for how, kind of how you operate the languages you use, um, you, know, how, you know, your CI, CD processes, right? So that's an important step too. So it's not, it's not one size fits all. Um, all right, so now that you kind of understand, hopefully, the process that we went through and how we kind of analyze the tools. Let's go through each category, show the tools, and show what we picked. Um, so we're going to start with code scanners. Um, so first off, what, what, you know, again, what do we mean by code scanners? Um, identify vulnerabilities. I like this. You know, I'm not, again, I'm not a developer. I'm the CISO. But uh, code smells, AI issues with your code. Um, you know, could cover the OWASP top 10, the CWE uh, top 25, you know, secrets that are out there. You know, any custom rules that you, that you don't want within your code, you know, things like that. So these code scanners can help you detect those issues while you're developing. So here's, an, here's a list of open source uh, code scanners. And you can see that we, we grouped together the SAS scanners and also the secrets detectors, uh, uh, secrets detection in here. Um, you see there's quite a few tools out here. Um, I'm not sure if, you know, I'm, I'm curious, maybe we could talk after the, you know, we don't um, have a lot of time here, but, you know, are you familiar with these tools? Because we spent a lot of time kind of searching and enumerating these tools and then evaluating uh, the tools. So can we, we, we looked overall, you know, some of these tools like Spotbugs, Bandit, AWS Git Secrets, SEMGREP, uh, you know, listed here on the screen, GitLeaks. Um, and we chose SEMGREP um, along with GitLeaks. Right, so a couple reasons why. One, kind of go, going back to our criteria, result quality. We felt like SEMGREP uh, you know, really helped with the, uh, the from, from the security uh, perspective. You know, many different security tools were integrated within SEMGREP, like Git leaks for the for the um, the uh, uh, the secret detection, and then it supported so many different languages as well. So we like SEMGREP uh, open source for that reason. Um, and here's just a quick example showing how. Uh, GitLeaks is actually running within SEMGREP for the secrets detection. Just a simple way where we, uh, we were able to run and detect uh, you know, some potential secrets within our code, which happens all the time, right? So we want to you know, continually check for that. Um, you know, kind of looking at the developer experience for SEMGREP, you know, again, it runs everywhere. So that it met, you know, to kind of check the boxes there. And then it's super fast, right? There was no compilation. We were able to run SEMGREP and get quick results back on issues and vulnerabilities within our code. And then that customizability perspective, you know, super extensible, many outputs, you know, anyone could write the rules again. It was simple to write, so we felt like SEMGREP met the, you know, uh, fit the bill for us across all the, all the criteria. And again, the power of having Git leaks within SEMGREP. We also like Trufflehog as well from a secret detection perspective, so that's kind of how we looked at um, 
how we looked at the, the code scanners. Um, here's the sub view of the, the maturity perspective. And I think it's cool to look at like, okay, like how many users, um, the GitHub stars, the Docker polls, right? It's kind of like the restaurant reviews. It, this gave us a lot of confidence that, hey, we like the way SimGrep works and the community likes it as well, right? So that, that helped, us to, uh, helped us in choosing SimGrep. Uh, all right, so up next is dependency checking. Um, you know, second on the list here for good reason with all the software supply chain, um, you know, issues out there and, and breaches and attack vectors, you know, bad actors are certainly looking for that now. It's front and center. Uh, I think there was a really good talk earlier talking about how like ransomware has come down a little bit. Um, but certainly if you look at like software supply chain, you know, that's, that's, that's front and center with a lot of the breaches out there, which I'm sure you guys are tracking. Uh, you know, what is this? Again, it's we're detecting open source components with publicly disclosed, disclosed vulnerabilities. So looking at this term SCA or software composition analysis um, to find those vulnerable libraries and software packages in our, in our environments. Um, so what were the contestants? Um, you can see here on the screen, um, you know, quite a few that we looked at. Um, and this actually, I love giving this talk because I've, I've given it like once or twice before. And we've actually updated here uh, because we, you know, uh, in terms of the tools we're, we're utilizing, uh, but you can see things like if you're familiar with NPM audit, um, OWASP has their own tool called dependency check. Uh, but the one in the middle there, open source vulnerabilities by Google, we just, uh, we made a change and we're using the, this now, uh, uh, OSV by Google. Um, so, OS, which is actually called, so it's OSV scanner is kind of the scanner that runs at the top. And then uh, Google manages the, the database that, of the, the vulnerable software libraries that runs underneath OSV scanner. So we really liked it for that reason. Um, you know, if you look at the result quality right there, right? Hey, if Google's managing the database, again, it's, it's open source, you know, it's Google's kind of managing this open source project. Uh, we like the fact that it's it, that the OSV scanner is leveraging that OSV database of all those vulnerable software packages underneath. Um, you know, aggregates the curated sources, so the things like GitHub security advisories as well, and supports a lot of different languages. Um, now, looking at the developer experience, uh, you know, uses that OSV schema. It can run anywhere, so we felt like from a developer perspective, super easy to use, right? Um, you know, the, the, the scanner is very lightweight in terms of running and again, the power of that, that OSV database that, that Google manages. Um, you can also see on the screen here, it shows some of the things like the OpenSSF. If you guys know OpenSSF, that's another good source to say, hey, what's the quality of this open source uh, you know, project? Uh, got a passing grade. And then you can see some of the stars and the forks and the watchers here on the right hand side. Uh, the customizability. Um, again, ability to scan specific uh, software building materials, that was great. Multiple op options, including a, a recursive uh, scan, so we like that as well. And then from a maturity perspective, you know, really seeing this take off. And this is this like stargazers uh, chart that we looked at. We can see that, hey, uh, OSV scanner, you know, a ton of people are using it. I think it, I think it went officially live at the beginning of this calendar year, um, if that's right. Yeah, actually back in December of last year. Um, but you know, it's taken off, right? So we, we, we like it for that reason. You know, a lot, of, a lot of key contributors there and people that are using it and liking it. All right, so up next is uh, infrastructure as code scanners. Um, and you know, this gets into detecting those, you know, those misconfigurations. I don't know why you know, AWS out of, the, out of the box and GCP and Azure, why they have some of these default settings which are, are not great that need to be corrected, but they're out there. Of course, you can have an you know, inadvertent misconfiguration in your infrastructure as code, things like missing encryption, you know, permissions are too broad, not you know, appropriate logging, some of the basic you know, kind of minimum viable security pieces that could be um, a problem within, within your infrastructure as code. Um, the contestants here for uh, infrastructure as code, we looked at TFSEC by Aqua, Kix by Checkmarks, uh, Checkout by Bridge Crew, and then TerraScan by Tenable. We chose Kix, um, a couple reasons why. The result quality. I think what's really amazing about Kix and running all these infrastructure scan, uh, as code scans, you know, 2,000 queries. Um, so there's a lot of things, lot, like a lot of potential misconfigurations that Kix is looking for. Then there's this nightly build, right? It's being constantly updated. Uh, so I got a lot, you know, as a CISO, I got a lot, a lot of comfort around the, you know, how often Kix is being updated. Um, and then if you look at the developer experience, 
again, you know, all these built-in remediation re recipes. So it's not only, hey, we found this misconfiguration. Well, what's the what's the fix, right? So Kix has a lot of those built-in remediation recipes, and they can run everywhere. Um, and then that customizability, you know, you, you know, the the queries can be written in a lot of different ways, and supporting these uh, kind of um, supporting new frameworks as well. So we really liked how we could kind of cater Kix to our environment. And then we, and they, and from a maturity perspective, we saw that Kix had a, you know, a lot of uh, you know, queries, uh, users um, was constantly being updated, so we got a lot of comfort around the maturity of Kix as well. Here's just a quick view of like what it looks like to run Kix. Is it uh, like within an Amazon uh, EBS or Elastic Block Store, uh, you know, we're running Kix against that specific resource, uh, and they came back and said, hey, there's a couple of findings here. Uh, with, with the text here in pink that shows, hey, there were some unencrypted volumes. It ranked them as a medium. It gave us the you know, the result, the the risk ranking, you know, the data that we needed, uh, kind of usable data uh, from that perspective. Uh, let's move on here, and I, I'm going to talk kind of quick because uh, there's a lot to cover here. Not to go kind of Jim Manico style on you guys, but uh, I'll wrap up here because I got a few minutes left. But uh, for container scanning. Um, again, what you know, container scanning detect vulnerabilities and, and, and configuration issues in our container images. Uh, we looked at Trivi, Claire, and Gripe were the three kind of container scanners we looked at from an open source perspective. Uh, we like Trivi. Uh, we like the fact that it supports uh, scanning container images. You know, all these to kind of different um, you know different types. Um, so we, we really like that. It can generate an S bomb. That was that was helpful as well. From a developer experience perspective, super simple to set up, right? So our developers that got, got Trivi going, it can run anywhere. It didn't take long at all to, to run the scans. Uh, from a customizability perspective, uh, again, very extensible. You can write your own logic, uh, you know, plugins right into the CLI. And it's highly popular with a large community. You can see some of the stats here on the screen. Well, you know, a lot of people are using Trivi out there. And then here's just a quick quick example of the results from Trivi. It shows, hey, it's got even got the CVEs tied to a specific risk ranking, and then talks about you know specifically uh, specifically what the vulnerability was that was detected. Uh, and then last is the runtime scanning. Definitely not least, um, you know, from a runtime perspective, of course, at you know you, you do everything you can to shift left. You detect those vulnerabilities as much as you can as part of your development process, but you know, there's going to be new vulnerabilities, or you know, you may you may have to you may have to release some vulnerabilities into your environment. You may not know you did it. Uh, so that dynamic application security testing that's a big, uh, you know, a really important part of any good security program. We looked at Zap, uh, OWASP Zap. We looked at Nikto, uh, Wapiti, and then Arachni as contestants for our DAS scanning, um, and we chose OWASP Zap. Um, I don't know if, if you guys have used Zap, it's, it's probably the most popular open source, um, you know, uh, web application scanning tool out there. Uh, we actually hired S Simon Bennett, who, who runs the Zap project. We actually hired him at JIT, uh, so he's part of our team now, uh, which we're super excited about. Uh, but we like the fact Zap's got you know a ton of features out there. It's aligned with the OWASP top ten, which is really important. All these different rules, you know, fantastic. Um, and then from a developer experience, you can run it pretty much anywhere. You know, pen testers use it, developers can use it. You know, really good, um, you know, really good developer experience uh, can be integrated into your CI CD pi uh, pipeline. Um, and then, you know, super customizable, a lot of different extensions out there. Uh, it, it can extend to the CLI. And then, you know, from a maturity perspective, it's again, probably the most well known open source web application API scanner out there. So that's why we like Zap. Um, here's just a quick view of the output from Zap. You know, detected some of the you know vulnerabilities, um, and actually shows in here, um, you know, specifically what was detected. You know, cross-site scripting attack you know, gives a gives some of the information like the the severity and other other important data um, that's uh, that's part of a Zap a Zap scan. This is just the kind of the the the, um, the, the code here, the the, the results back. All right, um, I know I ran through that really quickly. Uh, typically, I'd maybe spend more like an hour on that, but I wanted to get, kind of do a brain dump with you guys, just show you all the work that we did on analyzing these, these open source tools and kind of getting them all into the, uh, you, know, kind of, you know, making the selection, the right fit for us, and the reasons why we use them. Um, so here's just a quick view of like all the different types of tools that we're utilizing at JIT. Uh, and I, you know, I think the one thing 
um, and talk a bit about our product for just a minute, is that one of the challenges is like, okay, great, I've picked all these open source tools, I've integrated them in my CI CD processes, I'm gonna run the scans, you know, um, on a regular basis, you know, for every code commit. That's still a lot of work as a developer to be able to manage that, even though you pick the right tools for your environment. So how do you manage all that? I mean, the answer is an orchestration platform, and that's exactly what JIT is, is a security or orchestration platform. So at JIT, you can actually utilize all of the tools I talked about. You can, you know, you can integrate, and again, if you're using GitHub and AWS, super simple to integrate with our platform. And then once you do, you can turn on all those tools, and then we'll orchestrate those, we'll run all the scans for you. You know, so you know, as a developer, you can stay in GitHub, all the results, that's actually the next screen here. You know, the JIT will run automatically for each, co each code commit, each pull request, let you know about any findings that were detected, you can fix it right there. So you have to go to some security meeting, you don't have to go, you know, uh, be, be sent some report, you have to go look at something else, you can stay within GitHub and fix the vulnerability right there, or determine it's a false positive and move on. Um, because that's really the future of security in our minds. Um, and then there's things like we can see exactly like per poll request and like for the past couple weeks, you can see specifically about, um, you know, how you're performing, you know, are you fixing things? Are you ignoring a lot of findings? You get a lot of false positives, maybe go back and reevaluate some tools and, and configuration from that perspective. So a lot, a lot, a lot of capabilities there. Um, Great, all right, well, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna uh, stop here um, because I realize I'm, I'm a couple minutes over. I'd love to talk to anybody. I'll be hanging out for the rest of the day before I head back to Texas. But again, thanks everybody for your time. If anybody took any pictures, uh, please send them over. You know, e feel free to email them over to me, chris at jit.io, would appreciate that. Um, and again, any questions about, about the product, about the, you know, how we pick the open source tools and kind of a deeper dive. Um, let me know. And also, I have some, uh, we have some amazing swag. Our branding is awesome. I don't wear the t-shirt, but um, if you'd like a water bottle or bag, please come say hi to me. I've got some stuff to give away, and thanks, everybody, for your time.